an ancient temple is discovered in the Middle East. It's thousands of years older than the Egyptian pyramids. It dates from long before the earliest civilizations, like the Mesopotamian, the Minoan, and the Mayan. It was built when mankind was still in the Stone Age. This is extraordinary. But who built it, and why? They are not from our world. They are human-like, but they are clearly not humans. To solve the mystery, one man travels back 12,000 years to the end of the last ice age. Long before we discovered pottery, writing, or the wheel. It's like discovering that a three-year-old child's built the Empire State Building out of toy bricks. For millions of years, mankind evolved slowly. We survived by hunting and gathering our food. Then, around 12,000 years ago, something extraordinary happens. Our development speeds up. And in a comparatively short space of time, we go from the Stone Age to walking on the moon. What was it that made us change so dramatically? Dr. Jeff Rose is an expert on early human history. He spent years studying this mysterious turning point in our cultural evolution. He's now come to Turkey to investigate an astonishing discovery that might finally explain how and why we took that giant step out of the Stone Age to become who we are today. Walking on the moon was not the greatest leap mankind ever made. It was probably learning how to farm and produce our own food. The theory is that farming allowed us to settle down, to develop religion and build temples. Settlements grew into cities and then into powerful civilizations. Without having to hunt and gather for every meal, we had time to think, to invent, and evolve out of the Stone Age. At least that was the theory until now. Something pretty incredible has been found here in Turkey that puts a whole new spin on our cultural evolution. I cannot wait to see it. Turkey is an ancient land that bridges Europe and Asia. It's part of the Fertile Crescent, a swathe of the Middle East and Africa that includes modern Egypt, Israel, Syria, and Iraq. In this green belt, humans first settled, and the world's earliest civilizations arose around 5,000 years ago. And here is where the find has been made, at a place called Gobekli Tepe. Gobekli Tepe means Potbelly Hill in Turkish. Local people believe the hill to be sacred, perhaps with good reason. Professor Klaus Schmidt is a renowned German archaeologist. In 1995, beneath this hill, he made an astonishing discovery, and he's been excavating it ever since. Hi, Trev. How are you? Hi, Klaus. Welcome here at the site. Great to meet Your you. Your first visit here? This is extraordinary. I mean, I've never seen anything like this. What Professor Schmidt found buried under the hill was a cluster of huge stone pillars decorated with strange carvings. He knew he'd only uncovered a small part of the site. To find out how big it was, Professor Schmidt commissioned a survey with ground-penetrating radar. The survey covered close to 90,000 square meters, nearly as big as 20 football fields. The radar transmits radio waves into the soil, which bounce back when they hit a buried object. The variations in the reflected signal 
produce an image of what's underground. This enables Professor Schmidt to roughly establish the overall size of the site. How big is a site? 300 by 300 meters. 300 by 300, yeah. it's massive. Roughly. With extreme care and patience, Professor Schmidt and his team have so far excavated four huge stone circles. Each one is surrounded by a high stone wall broken at intervals by large T-shaped pillars. In the middle are two massive monoliths, up to five and a half meters tall. These enclosures don't look like anything in existence today. What could they be used for? How do we know nobody lived here? It's clearly uh, not, of, not for daily life. Professor Schmidt has worked extensively on other prehistoric sites in Turkey and is very familiar with the kind of dwellings Stone Age people built. He believes Gobekli Tepe looks nothing like them. Perhaps the key to understanding this place lies in the impressive carvings on the pillars. There you see a masterpiece of, of craftsmanship and high relief. Most probably a leopard. Is that all one block? It's one block made from one stone. Very well done work, very naturalistic. We can see the ribs are clearly depicted on this animal. The nose, the muscles, the teeth, and an aggressive habit. The craftsmanship is amazing. I mean, it looks like it could have been done yesterday. Yeah. So what is the significance of the animals here at the site? As uh, animals depicted in high relief seem to be more like guardians, guardians of the T-shapes. The T-shaped pillars reveal tantalizing clues to understanding Gobekli Tepe. The markings on them show that they're not just stone monoliths. They are stylized humans. These are stylized humans? Yeah, yeah. So seeing the T-shaped beings, the human had seen in profile, the body here, and now the arm is coming down, and the hand is depicted here with its fingers, and a belt is shown below the, the hands. So he's got and, another one here. Yeah, that's the second hand here, a belt buckle here, and a loincloth hanging down, a fox skin. So they're sort of standing yeah, they're standing this like way, this like with this. a loincloth. But the pillars are all faceless. There is no trace of any eyes, nose, or mouth. And this, I think, is a, is a sign that they are not from our world. They are coming from a spiritual life, so they are not humans. They are human-like, but they are clearly not humans. If they're not human, who or what do they represent? Are these people, or are they ancestors, or deities? Maybe they are the earliest gods depicted in mankind. Most archaeologists believe that if a monumental building has representations of gods, it's likely to be some kind of sanctuary. So would this be the oldest temple in the world? This is the oldest temple in the world, yeah. How uh, old is it? 11,500 years they are standing here. Gobekli Tepe is much more sophisticated than Stonehenge, and yet it's 6,000 years older. It's 7,000 years older than the Egyptian pyramids. But there are more enclosures still buried beneath the hill. Some of them might be even older than that. What puzzles Dr. Rose is that at that time, around 12,000 years ago, Mankind is in the Stone Age. We know how to make fire, but we haven't discovered the wheel. And we still haven't domesticated pack animals to help us. So how could we have built something so monumental? To build a place like this would have required a pretty sophisticated level of organization. You need a massive workforce of stonemasons, diggers, quarrymen, hundreds of people to bring the stones up and set them in place.
So who are these Stone Age people who can build such a place before we've even discovered how to make a clay pot? What will the oldest temple in the world reveal about our distant past? Gobekli Tepe has shocked scientists. Gobekli Tepe is smaller than an Egyptian pyramid, but the people that designed and built this place would have required a similar level of organization 7,000 years earlier. To carve, build, erect these pillars would have required a massive workforce, all needing to be fed and housed. So who were these people? Dr. Rose now goes looking for Gobekli Tepe's builders. If he finds out who they are, he may be able to answer the other big questions. Why did they build it? What was it for? Even after 12,000 years, there are some clues as to who the temple builders are. A large quantity of animal bones have been found during the temple's excavation. Dr. Rose wants to know what they might reveal about Gobekli Tepe's builders. What kind of bones do we have here? The first important group uh, are the gazelles, which uh, you see here a number of bone specimens. There is also remains of wild boar. We have remains of uh, red deer, wild sheep. Most of them represent uh, bones from meaty parts. So we are looking at uh, consumption refuse. All of this is wild. All, all the remains uh, pertain to wild animals. There's no sign of uh, domestic uh, herbivore. So then what does this tell us about the people at Gobekli Tepe? It implies that we are still dealing with hunter-gatherers at Gobekli Tepe, and that we are dealing with a free agricultural society. This evidence is of immense importance, because for a long time, the theory was that people could only build something like Gobekli Tepe once they were living in large agricultural communities, like the Egyptians thousands of years later. Farming provides a surplus, so people don't have to look for food every day. They settle down and have the time and resources to develop religious ideas, build temples and feed the builders. That's the theory. But the ancient bones at Gobekli Tepe tell a different story. The temple builders were not farmers. They were still hunter-gatherers. Traditionally, that means semi-nomadic people living in small, mobile bands, traveling light, following the seasons, going where the food is. But in the Fertile Crescent, hunter-gatherers had started to settle at least a thousand years before Gobekli Tepe was built. And it wasn't due to farming. They just reached a point when they realized that it was of greater benefit to develop and pass on knowledge in a large settled group than in a small nomadic one. This is the site of Jaffa Lakhmet. It's exactly the same date as Gobekli Tepe, the early period of Gobekli Tepe. So about 12,000 years 12, ago. 12,000 years ago, yeah. And it's uh, um, a small village of clustered houses, as you can see. But in the center, there's this extraordinary building, which is much larger. You can see that uh, it's got all these internal walls, but there's no internal doors. The so nobody lived in this structure? No, this is the communal storage facility for the whole village. Communal storage means that these early settlements are now harvesting and storing wild grains and sharing them amongst the community. With a store of food, people now do have the time to plan and build a monumental temple. Gobekli Tepe sits up on a hill with no immediate access to water. People have to carry their food and drink up there which means they can't stay in the temple for very long. So where do they live? Dr. Rose decides to investigate the largest city close to Gobekli Tepe. It's only 15 kilometers away and is called Shanlufa. Its history is impressive. Local tradition says that Abraham, the patriarch of today's three great monotheistic religions, was born here around 4,000 years ago. 
But Dr. Rose finds evidence that the town is much older than that. Turkish archaeologist Dr. Bahatin Çelik is an expert on Şanlıurfa's distant past. Here, in the ground beneath the city, we've found flint tools that indicate that there was a Stone Age settlement here, close to 11,000 years ago. For Dr. Rose, this is evidence that people are living here during the construction of Göbekli Tepe. Could they be the builders of the temple? He then learns of an intriguing piece of evidence at the Şanlıurfa Museum. This statue was unearthed during construction work in the town. It's nearly 11,000 years old, almost as old as Göbekli Tepe. But this figure has a well-defined face, unlike the monoliths at the temple. Similar statues have been found at Göbekli Tepe. They are kept off-site to help preserve them. This guy is fairly similar to the large statue that the black eyes. OK, he's a little bit smaller, and he's a little bit more heavily weathered. But you can see he once had facial features. So the people that built Göbekli Tepe knew how to make statues with faces on them. They must have deliberately left facial features off those large monoliths because they were trying to depict some kind of deity or supernatural being. These statues show that it is quite possible that the inhabitants of Shanlufa could have built Gobekli Tepe. But they were Stone Age people. And the temple shows a level of engineering skill no one thought possible until thousands of years later. Dr. Rose is puzzled. So how did these people, who had not yet discovered agriculture, how did they plan, organize, and build something like this? It's like discovering that a three-year-old child's made the Empire State Building out of toy bricks. How'd they do it? Could Stone Age people really have built a place like Gobekli Tepe thousands of years before the pyramids? Adding to this puzzle is that the engineering skills involved must have been developed a long time before the temple is built. The earliest enclosures are built on the bedrock. Into slots only about 10 centimeters deep, they set the two central monoliths. They're up to five and a half meters tall, carved from a single piece of stone and weigh up to 14 and a half tons. To make these huge sewn pillars requires considerable skill and some knowledge of geology. Dr. Rose now turns to an expert in stone carving to understand exactly how they are made. Dave Chapman has spent years studying and replicating the way prehistoric people worked with stone. So all of this that we see here on this rocky landscape is part of the quarry that was used to make the monoliths. It would appear so. So this is one of the monoliths? Yeah, this is one of the monoliths. This is fantastic. This is about, about seven meters long. So we think this is one of the early ones, uh, probably about 12,000 years old. Using hard granite picks, the Stone Age masons roughly carve out the monolith while it is still on the ground. And then they're likely to be using levers, so they, they may well have had uh, a fulcrum at the front, and then the levers go over the, over the fulcrum. So they're just prying this giant thing up. Yeah. I think you can see evidence for this in the fact that they've actually broken the stone in lifting it. This crack here. Yeah. Once they've got it pried up, yeah. how in the world did they get it to the top of that hill? Basically, the, it's like rowing on land. Now the levers go in, and instead of sitting inside the boat, people stand outside. You push down on the lever, and then pull back on the lever, and it goes forward. How many people do you think it would have taken to do all this? I think a team of 50 men could comfortably uh, cut this and move this across the landscape. Around the monoliths, they then build a wall of stones and mortar, nearly two meters tall. Set into the wall are smaller T-shaped pillars, between three and five meters high, and weighing up to 10 tons. Dr. Rose wants to know how long it might have taken Gobekli's builders to make an enclosure. So Dave Chapman 
begins by making a replica of one of the temple's carvings on a slab of local limestone using the same Stone Age tools. We're going to use her stone picks and her stone blades for picking, carving and engraving. These are tools that we're making ourselves. We just take a flake off like that. So you're like sharpening it that way. It gives us a very sharp, fierce cutting edge. This carving expertise is present throughout the temple, even in the temple's doorways. This strange object, it's a porthole stone, and we expect that it was an entrance in a vertical position there in this wall. The portal is the entrance to the enclosure. It weighs several tons and was carved from a single piece of stone. Earlier you had mentioned um, you know, ideas about the netherworld and, and yeah. sort of going down in and being reborn. So it looks like the entrance to the netherworld. If these enclosures represent a gateway to the underworld, then the temple must have had something to do with death. Vital to creating this dark world are the creatures carved on the pillars. It looks like a laborious process, but Stone Age masons were masters of their medium. That is awesome. It's incredible. So how long did it take you to do it? It's uh, taken about uh, six hours so far. So then you figured about 20 of these in each enclosure. Yes. How long do you think it would have taken them to do an entire enclosure? Well, based on what we've actually d discovered by doing, actually creating one of the pictures, um, our guesstimate around 300 hours, some, something in that region. So then start to finish, how long do you think it would take to make one enclosure? Well, just r running the figures back, back and based on about 60 or 70 people working on the site, it's achievable within, say, 6 to 12 months, something, something like that, maybe a bit longer with a smaller crew. The finished enclosures are roughly 10 to 30 metres in diameter, but Professor Schmidt now knows there are many more than just four of them. A map generated from the ground penetrating radar survey shows the excavated areas in colour with the monoliths in red. It reveals there are at least another 16 circular structures buried beneath the hill. That's a lot of stonework. But the scan reveals something even more surprising. In, in blue here is a face we, we couldn't date for a long time, but it looks like these structures most probably are the oldest one. So we expect 2,000, 3,000 years more, so we're coming to the 12th, 13th millennium BC. That's the end of the last ice age. Yes, we are just at the end of the last ice age. That would imply that the structures that lie buried under this corner of the hill were built 14 to 15,000 years ago. That's nearly 5,000 years before people here began farming. The critical event which, in theory, made religion and temple building possible and set us on a fast track towards the stars. What I'd like to know is, why did these people undertake such an extraordinarily big and difficult task in the first place? What's it all for? Dr. Rose is certain the key to understanding Gobekli Tepe lies in the images carved on its stone pillars. What do they mean? To help him understand the ancient carvings, he now travels to Istanbul to look at the symbols in another temple. The Church of the Holy Saviour in Kora was originally built some 1,600 years ago, then rebuilt 850 years later. The mosaics covering its walls are an excellent example of Christian imagery. 
key to any place of worship is that the symbols are understood by everybody that gathers there. Its role is to unite the congregation in a common purpose through shared beliefs and all the rituals that go with them. If I came from a different culture and knew nothing about Christianity, all of these images, the layout, the decor, would be completely incomprehensible to me. Without understanding the meaning behind the symbols, I wouldn't have a clue what any of it meant and how this place was used. But we know Gobekli Tepe's builders were hunter-gatherers, which allows us to arrive at a probable explanation of why it was built. Hunter-gatherers share their food with a small, trusted group of family and friends. When they settle, they have more children. Communities grow fast. Populations reach the hundreds, even thousands. Now they must learn to share with strangers and live together in peace. This requires a moral code and a whole new level of trust. So you need something which pulls the community together, which shows that you share these ethical codes. Yeah? And a project like building a great facility and having ceremonies that go with it and its use does that. It comprises an ethical code of this is how you behave if you belong in our community. Different neighboring communities draw together an array of talents to make the religion concrete. So a stonemason from one group, a master builder from another, a carver from another, and they build a temple. A massive project like this forces people to work together, to rely on each other, and trust one another. It unites people. Something like, if I see you in my church, or I see you in my synagogue, I trust you. I may not know you very well, but I trust you. But what belief system does their temple represent? For thousands of years before Gobekli Tepe, it appears that people believe that everything, animals, plants, stones, natural phenomena, all have a spirit. Man is only one small part of nature. In the caves, the nature is depicted and nearly no humans or the humans are inferior to them. Now, human-like pillars tower above nature which is represented by wild and dangerous creatures. These central pillars may indicate a different mentality. All of a sudden, uh, human beings are in the center of, of things. The presence of these animals below the head of the anthropomorphic figure suggests that uh, human beings, that they are superior to animals. To put ourselves above nature is a huge change from how we see ourselves in earlier cave paintings. In comparison to the, the painted caves, this is a very, very uh, important shift, a very important change towards a very different spiritual world which is now dominated by human-like beings. The large numbers of animal bones found at the site might also suggest that people gathered for feasts at the temple. Uh, when, when they had these gatherings here, when they had the feasting here, they needed a lot of food, so they, they had been now looking for, for a constant food supply, and this, in simple words, could, be, could have been the base for the idea now to manage the nature, to be food production, and not just hunter-gathering. Professor Schmidt's theory is radical. If these settled hunter-gatherers are motivated to take up farming to satisfy the temple's need of food, then the spark that set off that giant step out of the Stone Age was religion. So do you think then that, that religion itself is, is the, the impetus that, that pushed people or moved people toward farming? Yes, so our religion is, is uh, bringing people towards farming. So. We always thought that organized religion developed as people settled and started farming. But this religion predates agriculture. So what were they trying to achieve? 
The new religion gives humans an enormous psychological advantage. It places us above the animals and above nature. It's probably that mental leap forward which is needed to start domesticate animals and plants. It's now clear to Dr. Rose that Gobekli Tepe represents a dramatic turning point in our development. Its pillars and carvings depict the new way we see ourselves in nature. But what rituals or ceremonies take place there? Professor Schmidt has found some interesting clues. We see a body of a human, the shoulders, the arms, the erected penis, and clearly no head. It's a horrifying scenario, together with the scorpion and the snakes and the vulture and so on. So we have maybe a depiction of, of the nether world. All these observations are strengthening our ideas that we have here to do with burial reasons. Burial rites in other settlements of the time of Gobekli Tepe were quite strange. Bodies are buried and later dug up and their skulls removed to be used as relics. Was Gobekli Tepe dedicated to death rituals? It is not difficult to imagine Gobekli Tepe as a temple devoted to the dead. A portal leading into a flickering netherworld where the skulls of the deceased are separated from their bodies and bizarre rituals performed beneath imposing monoliths proclaiming man's mastery over the wild beasts. Dr. Rose realizes Gobekli Tepe has turned history on its head. We'd always thought that it was the discovery of agriculture that transformed scattered hunter-gatherer groups to farming communities, and from there to today's sophisticated societies. But now, it looks like the big cultural revolution happened before agriculture. And what motivates that cultural revolution is the new religion in which we are superior to the beasts. We build the temple to unite us in the new faith, and this effort pushes us to take that giant evolutionary step into farming. Gobekli Tepe suggests that it was the urge to worship that sparked civilization. And then Dr. Rose learns something bizarre. After the huge effort to build this extraordinary place, the people who use it then bury it. Why? The downfall of the oldest temple in the world is as mysterious as the religion it serves. For over a thousand years, the temple occupies a central place in the cultural life of the region. People living up to 200 kilometers away use it as a ritual center and somewhere they can share news, ideas and discoveries. Here, the agricultural revolution that changes the course of mankind begins to take shape. And as this new way of life develops, so the temple changes with the times. Around 1,500 years after the large circular spaces with the massive monoliths were built, they were filled in, covered over, and then the smaller structures were built on top. It looks like Gobekli Tepe was being downsized. It was part of the program to erect such a circle, to use it for some time, but later to backfill it completely. So the final appearance was not that of a building, but that of a mound. Eventually, all these mounds become one big hill. Excavating it, Professor Schmidt has now uncovered one of the smaller enclosures built over the older ones. Yeah, now we are in B. This comes later this than what we saw this over there. Later than C and D, so it's quite okay. clear. With, again, two central pillars, well preserved, but with a height of only four meters. These four-meter monoliths are now a full one and a half meters shorter than the older ones. Later on, 
even smaller rectangular spaces are built on top of the previous ones. Gobekli Tepe hangs on for another a thousand years, but the downsizing is dramatic. The enclosures get smaller, the monoliths progressively shorter, and the number of pillars in the surrounding wall dwindle until there are none. Finally, around 10,000 years ago, Gobekli Tepe disappears, buried beneath a man-made hill. But why did they so completely erase such an important place? To find out, Dr. Rose drives over 30 kilometers from Gobekli Tepe to investigate another settlement of that time. When the Euphrates River was dammed in 1990, over 800 square kilometers were flooded. Beneath these deep waters lies one of the possible reasons for the downfall of Gobekli Tepe. Dr. Rose has come to see some photographs, taken before the flooding, of the ruins of a Stone Age village called Nivali Chori. It was inhabited at the time of Gobekli Tepe. The pictures show that around 10,000 years ago, something new appears in the village. Another kind of communal space. It's a small, square enclosure with 13 stone pillars in its walls and two faceless monoliths in the center, with arms and hands carved on them. It's a smaller, localized version of the Grand Cathedral at Gobekli Tepe, like a village church. These kind of sacred spaces show up in a number of settlements at that time and coincide with the downsizing of Gobekli Tepe. Local communities had started to build their own sacred spaces, maybe because they didn't want to hike up to the big temple at the top of the hill. Gobekli Tepe had started to lose its importance. In a sense, it's a victim of its own success. That unifying faith had taken root all throughout the local communities. But there may also be another explanation for the abandonment of the temple. The descendants of Gobekli's builders were no longer hunter-gatherers. They were farmers. And they weren't interested in the ways of their ancestors. When the people became farmers, they didn't need anymore the place of their ancestors where they worshipped the spirits or the gods of the hunter-gatherer society. The new generation of farmers are looking to the future and the customs and beliefs of their forefathers fall out of fashion. Dr. Rose can see that the cultural revolution is now complete. Farming is our new way of life. And Gobekli Tepe must vanish with the past. But he is astonished to find that some of its beliefs are still with us today. They are at the root of one of the deepest doctrines of the Christian faith the mystery of the resurrection. Dr. Rose has learned many things on his journey through our prehistoric past, but there's still one piece of the puzzle he wants to understand. When Gobekli Tepe is buried around 10,000 years ago, what happens to the powerful beliefs that created it? Dr. Rose now travels over 400 kilometers west to search for traces of the religious ideas that built the world's oldest temple. Chattel Hoyuk is over 9,000 years old. Some believe it's the world's earliest town. Up to 8,000 people are known to have lived here. They were farmers. Dr. Tristan Carter has worked on the excavation and discovered a number of links with the Gobekli Tepe. So you're seeing the same imagery here that we saw at Gobekli Tepe. We've got wild bulls, we've got leopards, we've got uh, uh, wild boars. And it ties in with this very deep set of beliefs that goes back to at least two and a half thousand years to Gobekli Tepe. A belief system, a moral code that's maybe come out of a hunter-gatherer world is still essentially, you know, the, the basis of a community of farmers many hundreds of kilometers, many thousands of years later. So the burial of Gobekli Tepe is not the end of its story. 
Its seeds, both spiritual and physical, were spread far and wide. Whatever the meaning of its symbolism, the same imagery is found at later sites all throughout the region. Dr. Rose finds the same symbols he saw at Gobekli, now brought into the home 2,000 years later. What do you think the significance of having this inside the house is? The bull is obviously this incredibly important symbol to them, whether it represents a specific deity, a specific god, or is symbolic for sort of, you know, something deeper in terms of ritual. This is a small reproduction. Prehistoric wild cattle called aurochs would have stood over two meters tall at the shoulder, with horns spanning three meters. These are large, scary, killing beasts. <laughs> so, you know, to, to bring that power, that violence and domesticate it in here, it's a celebration of the hunt and the prowess of the individuals. And we think today still of, of the bullfights in Iberia. Think of the prowess and, and the honor associated with that. There's a real pragmatic and, and very reasonable fear of, of such a, a huge beast. The awe and respect we have for these powerful beasts and our desire to conquer them is still with us to this day. This depiction of burial rites is another intriguing image Dr. Rose finds here, 2,000 years on from Gobekli Tepe. It looks at first like the deceased have been left out to be consumed by vultures. We now appreciate from excavations of hundreds of, of burials that these characters were, were buried fully fleshed. People have gone back and re-excavated the dead. And then they very carefully removed the skulls. The skull cult is associated with ancestor worship. A person's skull is a physical reminder of them. Once removed from the body, it's displayed alone or with other skulls in a house or communal space. This is a way of bringing back to life an important person in order to keep alive a history that binds people together. It's a resurrection of, of a particular character who's very important to this particular lineage. Dr. Rose realizes that the headless man of Gobekli Tepe could represent a very early expression of the resurrection idea in which a deceased person or deity is brought back from the dead, uniting a people in a common cause or belief. Over the following millennia, this resurrection idea turns up in the religions of many civilizations, including Babylon, Egypt, India, and Greece. It survives to this day in the Christian faith. Dr. Rose now understands that although the ancient temple disappears, the beliefs it represents have continued to shape our culture for 12,000 years. We might never fully understand what went on at Quebecli Tepe, but from the clues I've gathered on this trip, some things have become clear. The construction of that temple represents the culmination of a long tradition of thought and craftsmanship that must extend back into the last ice age. It was a social nexus that brought communities together from far and wide. And most importantly, it represents a quantum leap in our spiritual expression. Instead of being just part of the natural world, we began to see ourselves as masters of it. By creating a temple for those giant stone deities fashioned in our image, we opened a portal to a new way of life. It was there, under those towering pillars, that we gave birth to the gods. Gobekli Tepe marks what is possibly the greatest turning point in our cultural evolution. A point when people began to form large communities, began to reevaluate their place in the world and began to domesticate plants and animals, the first giant step out of the Stone Age towards the Space Age.
delve into the mysteries of Britain's brutal past in Tony Robinson's Superstitions, brand new next Tuesday at 9. Stay tuned for the latest Air Crash Investigation.